Okay, go so, ahead. Yeah. So I'm meeting with the host now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. You go, uh, remember to stop that uh, yeah. Well, thanks everyone for being here. Um, I know it's late for you, so thank you for staying until um, And thanks for the organizers, for, uh, to the organizers for the invite. I'm very excited to be here. Okay, so today uh, I'll be talking in jo uh, joint work with John Boyd, that is still work in progress. Uh, and it's about enumerating triangular modular curves of low genus. Um, so how this talk is going to go is, uh, first I'm going to give you an overview of what our main result is going to be, um, and after, just for you to have it in mind, and after that I'm going to give you some motivation, why would you like to um, have results? Uh, then we're going to uh, talk about triangular modular curves, going a little bit back to Pete Clark's uh, talk. Uh, about them and then I'll show you some algorithms and if there is time I'll show you some magma demos uh, on how our code works. Okay, so uh, first our main result and the, the goal of this talk will be to understand this. Um, we What we did was um, enumerate all triangular modular coins that look like this, if you don't know how, uh, how this is defined, that's okay, we're gonna define it in the talk. But um, what we need was to enumerate all these curves with low genus, um, and we enumerated them with genus zero, one, and two. Um, we have a list of exactly these many curves of a given genus, and uh, you can do the same with X ones. So there are different kinds of curves that we will define during the talk, but the main goal is we can enumerate them, um, the ones that have low genus. So um, part of the motivation, um, why would you like to study low genus curves of, of this form comes from modularity. And I think this is a good transition to the second trimester of the program that um, is going to talk about modularity more. So we are going to start talking about modular curves. Um, so a modular curve, um, just a reminder, is a Riemann surface constructed as, well, the compacti compactification of a quotient of the upper half plane by the action of a congruence of group gamma of the, con uh, the congruence group SL2Z. Uh, so here, for example, we have a picture of the fundamental domain uh, for gamma 0, 5, one of the congruence of groups uh, of SL to C. Um, and um, it's really nice that we get a Riemann surface so we can study, uh, we can use geometry to study these Riemann surfaces. And um, the important, one of the reasons why we care about modular curves is that um, they parameterize elliptic curves, right? And they parameterize elliptic curves with certain uh, characteristics. For example, if you uh, pick the subgroup of SL2Z uh, gam gamma of N, uh, that's just the matrices that are congruent to the identity mod N, um, the name of the curve of the quotient of the compact compactification of the upper half plane uh, by gamma is Xn. And what, uh, what does this parameterize? It parameterizes elliptic curves with a basis for the full N torsion. So, a rational point on this curve gives us an elliptic curve with a basis for the full torsion. Similarly, if you take um, gamma one of n that corresponds to matrices M that are congruent to um, the identity and then upper triangular matrices um, here, um, you, you get something similar. You get a parameterization of elliptic curves with a point of order n. So maybe a little bit weaker than the full torsion, but still we get a point of order n. And then the last congruence of group that we can consider is gamma zero of n. Uh, and that's just uh, matrices that are upper triangular mod n. Um, and what they give us is elliptic curves with a cyclic isogeny of order n. Okay, so um, understanding rational points on these curves uh, lets us understand 
um, elliptic curves with certain characteristics, and we all love elliptic curves, so it, it's a really powerful result, right? Um, oh, so the, the, uh, question, the, the groups gamma do, uh, doesn't act faithfully on H, faithfully uh, on the hyperbolic plane. The minus one <laughs> element has the same action as identity. Minus yeah. identity, yeah. Yeah, it, so you're right that, uh, and that's something we're going to do later. Maybe we should consider PSL, so so we don't have yeah. uh, okay. scalars working. Uh, so yeah, considering yeah. SL2 that I think it has some other additional structure. Yeah, and yeah, some, you're some, right. some 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 higher order structure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, and that's something that we are going to do later, actually. Uh, so yeah, that's a great comment. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So uh, what we get is um, some covers uh, of these curves that look like this, right? Um, and then, so we we know that understanding modular curves, point, rational points on modular curves, implies understanding elliptic curves with certain structure. So um, a reasonable question to ask is when are there infinitely many elliptic curves with a given characteristic? If you ask when are there infinitely many elliptic curves with a, uh, with a um, torsion, five torsion point or, or something like that. Um, so we all know that um, in this case, we need our modular curve to have genus zero or one, right? Those are our only possibilities. And also, if we are trying to understand all the rational points on these modular curves, it's very useful to have curves of low genus, like genus 0, 1, or maybe 2, in which understanding the rational points is easier. Okay, so um, this is a result that has been around for a long time, and it's free, um, from Frico. Um, and that's just, it gives you an explicit list of all uh, modular curves that have genus zero. So X naught of N has genus zero if and only if N is part of this list. So any number from one to 10, and then these extra numbers that you have here. And then X naught has genus one if and only if it's in this uh, other list. And so on. Um, I think Frick has a um, characterization of everything uh, up to genus seven in this paper. Uh, but understanding the ones with low genus is, uh, is important because it gives you infinitely many rational uh, elliptic curves with certain characteristics, right? And then in the story keeps going and goes all the way to Mazur's theorem, um, saying that an elliptic curve defined over the rational numbers, uh, the torsion of the Mordell bell group um, of this curve is isomorphic to one of these curves, right? Um, so it's an important story and understanding curves of low genus really helps us um, understanding things about the elliptic curves. Okay, so that's kind of um, the motivation of the background. So um, these are modular curves. So they are quotients of the upper half plane by congruence of groups of SL2 or PSL2 uh, Z. Um, but in these, whole trimester we have been studying triangular groups, right? And triangular groups also can be seen as acting on the upper half plane. So maybe we can study curves that arise from these quotients. And that's what we are going to do with triangular modular curves. This is going to be a fast recap of what Pete Clark talked about earlier in, um, in this program, but hopefully it's, a, um, it's short enough and, um, and we can, go through it. So I think this is the um, obligatory slide to have in this program. Uh, we have a triangle group, um, just like as before, it uh, has a presentation like this. So we pick elements of order A, B, and C, and then we ask the product of the elements to be one. Um, and then in this talk, we're going to ask our triangle groups to be hyperbolic. And remember that hyperbolic just means that this quantity is less than zero. So here I have an example um, of a triangle group uh, to infinity, infinity, um, a triangulation, I guess. And 
um, when you see this triangle group acting on the upper half plane, what you get is um, two copies of the triangle because you end up um, considering only uh, orientation preserving isogeny. So you need you get two copies of the triangle and then you identify sides together like this and like this. So thanks to Leila for uh, her wonderful talk earlier tonight, um, we convinced ourselves that uh, these triangle groups give us, uh, when, we, when we act by triangle groups on the upper half plane, our result is the Riemann sphere by identifying these sides together. Um, so how do, how do these triangle groups act on, um, on the upper half plane? Well, we can use Takeuchi's uh, theorem from 1977 uh, that tells us that there is an embedding for any ABC hyperbolic, there is an embedding uh, from the triangle group um, to PSL2 uh, of R, right? And these uh, embedding can be given explicitly by sending a, a delta A and delta B to these matrices. Um, no, that delta C is completely determined from the relations between delta A and the delta B. And, and moreover, this embedding is unique up to conjugacy. Um, so we have kind of a unique embedding um, that looks like this. Okay. And it, the important thing is that, that it, can give, it can be given explicitly. So once we have this embedding, we know how to act with matrices uh, on the upper half plane. Uh, so we have an action of the triangle group on the upper half plane. And then I want to point out atten your attention into the trace field um, of, these, of these matrices. So we have um, cosine, cosine of pi over A here and cosine of pi over B here. And this is going to be important later. So uh, that's why I want to point out your attention to that. Yep. So now we can act with our triangle group on the upper half plane, um, and we can consider the quotient of this action. So um, again, the triangle group is acting on the upper half plane, and this quotient is a complex Riemann one or default of genus zero. So again, thanks Leila for um, explaining this very uh, in a wonderful way. And again, um, the genus zero comes from just gluing the sides of the action of the triangle and we get the Riemann sphere. Um, so we have a similar story uh, to what we had with modular curves, right? So we have uh, a group acting on the upper half plane. And in, mod in the case of modular curves, we realize that that tells us something about elliptic curves. Uh, and uh, the question is, can these do something similar? And the answer is yes. So these quotients um, of the upper half plane by triangle groups uh, parameterize hypergeometric abelian varieties. And they are just Jacobians of the of generalized gender curves um, that are curves of the form uh, y to the n equals x to the a times one minus x to the b times one minus cx uh, to the c. Okay, so they are cyclic covers of P1. And as a remark, you can give the integers A, B, C, and N explicitly from A, B, and C. So understanding these curves, triangular and modular curves, gives us an understanding of Jacobians of curves uh, of generalized or gender curves. And that's why it's interesting to study them. Okay, so again, we can play the same game. Um, we want to know when these triangular modular curves have genus zero and one, and that tells us something about uh, infinite, infinitely many rational points, maybe. Um, and again, having curves of low genus um, gives you a better hope of being able to find all the rational points on these curves. Um, yeah. So uh, now we defined our triangular modular curves. Uh, that look like this. So action, uh, just the question of the action by triangle groups of the upper half plane. And then we can pl play the same game as in modular curves. So now we need level structure. So defining level structure here is a little bit trickier, trickier than in the case of modular curves, uh, but we still can do it. And this is uh, what 
Pete Clark's talk um, was about, um, part of it at least. Uh, so we choose a hyperbolic triple, A, B, C, and then a rational prime P that uh, is prime to, to A, B, C. This condition can be relaxed a lot, uh, but just for the sake of time, we are going to choose P uh, not dividing to A, B, uh, to A, B, C. Okay, so we consider this tower of, um, of fields and um, this can look scary, but um, I just want you to remember that this is just the trace field of the embedding uh, that we have from the triangle group to PSL2R. So it is just a trace field. Um, and then E is an intermediate field uh, that just makes things work. Um, and as a remark, uh, we have that two cosine two pi over s uh, is just a sum of roots of unity. Um, so an, an s root of unity plus its inverse. So these are just cyclotomic fields. They all live inside a big cyclotomic field. And we can, uh, um, we can work with this field extension, remembering that they all live in a cyclotomic field. So that makes things easier to work with. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, we picked a prime um, over the rationals here, and that's not quite the prime giving us level of structure, but we can consider um, the splitting of um, P, the factorization of our rational prime P into our intermediate field E, and then into the big field F. So we have a tower of primes, and we just pick any prime above P um, and any prime above, above the square P. Okay. And uh, once we pick those primes, um, the result is that there is a homomorphism uh, that depends on the big prime in F, uh, but it goes from our triangle subgroup, uh, our triangle group, sorry, to PSL2 of the residue field of our prime on F. Uh, so the important part is that this is a finite field, right? Uh, so this, to this makes talking, uh, talking about congruences reasonable because we have a finite field and also it makes computations easier. Um, uh, so that's a good feature of this homomorphism. And then uh, we are going to define the group uh, delta of ABC comma P. Note that P is just a prime of P above our rational prime P as the kernel of this homomorphism. Okay, so the kernel of this homomorphism is a subgroup of our triangle group delta of ABC. So this um, group is a subgroup of delta of ABC, and this is going to be the analogous to our level of structure. So this is going to be like gamma in the case of modular curves. Okay, so that's what lets us um, define. Gamma, gamma P? Uh, yeah, gamma P, sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, so that's what, uh, what it lets us define the level of structure on these curves. Um, and then we, we, define, we can define the curves as just, uh, again, a quotient of the upper half plane by these um, congruent subgroups. Um, but Clark and Boyd have a really nice way of um, defining this level of structure and understanding these, uh, these curves. And they understand these curves as bell maps. So uh, again, we, given a hyperbolic triple and P a prime of E as, as before, um, there, there is a G Galois belly map uh, from X of ABC comma P. So again, this looks like um, the quotient of acting with um, the group, um, the, the subgroup delta of ABC comma P 
in the upper half plane. Um, and this is a belly map. And moreover, we know the ramif uh, we know the ramification indices. They are A, B, C. And then we also know the G group here. And it's just PSL or PGL of a finite field. Uh, and choosing PSL and PGL, it's a little bit subtle, but it just depends on uh, the splitting behavior of our prime of E into the extension F. Okay, so what does this give us? Uh, this gives us uh, a curve x of a, b, c, comma, p, defined just as this quotient, as I, I, as I wrote here. Um, and then a map from x to a, b, c. Because remember that this is just p1. So, so we have a map like this. So now we have defined level, level structure. And we understand that this cover is just a belly map. And understanding belly maps is easier than understanding any map in general. Okay, so since, uh, since we have a belly map and uh, we know the ramification indices, we can compute the genus of this curve. So the genus is just given by this formula that only depends on the size ABC and the size of G, where G is. Uh, any of these two groups. So computing the genus uh, is direct once you know what G uh, you're working with. Okay, and you can play the same game with not a prime, but any ideal N of E. Um, and you get, the, you get a similar story. Uh, again, for the sake of time, uh, we're doing it just for primes and then generalizing it, it is easier. Um, so now we have defined a uh, triangular modular course with level structure. And now if we, can, if we want to keep playing this game, we will have to define congruence of groups, right? Uh, so that's what's coming next. And to define congruence of groups, well, we know how do we define the level structure. We use this homomorphism uh, and then we, we said the, the subgroup, the congruent subgroup that we care about is just the, um, the kernel of this homomorphism. Okay, and we can play a similar game. Now that we have a homomorphism that goes to matrices, we can play the same game that we used to do um, with, modular, with regular modular curves. So uh, we defined H0 as the image of the upper triangular matrices in, in SL2 um, of ZF mod N. Okay, so um, same as before, um, you just take tri upper triangular matrices that live in this group, and then you project them to PSL2, and then that image is H0. H1 is similarly the image of the subgroup of upper triangular matrices with both diagonal entries uh, equal to one. So same, um, same game that we were playing before. Here we have upper triangular matrices and here we have um, diagonal entries equal to one and upper triangular matrices too. Okay. Uh, but right now our groups live here. Uh, so a reasonable thing to do is just to take the inverse image of those groups and see what we get. Okay, so uh, that's exactly what we do. We, we take the inverse of H0 and the inverse of H1, and we call them uh, delta node and delta one. And then something important to remember is that these delta node maybe should be written as delta node of ABC um, and because it depends on A, B, C and the prime you pick. Um, yeah. And then uh, um, and then once we choose these, these subgroups, we have our analogous. So this is the analogous of gamma zero, uh, gamma zero N, I guess. Um, 
And this is the analogous of gamma one of n. Um, so we, we pick our congruence of groups and then we're able to define curves just like we used to do it in modular curves. We define that H zero as uh, the quotient of acting by the, sub, the subgroup delta naught uh, on the upper half plane and H one similarly. And again, we have maps um, that, that uh, go like this. And then uh, just so, so it's not confusing, uh, this also depends on uh, the, um, the triple and the, and the ideal ubiquitous. Okay, so this completes the, analog, uh, the analogy that we have from modular curves and then translating it to these curves that we're calling triangular modular curves. Um, and then something interesting um, is that this happens for every A, B, and C, right? So we are, uh, so we have many, many curves. Uh, I don't know if it's fair to say more than with modular curves, we but we have many curves because this story happens with every A, B, and C and with every ideal N. So um, we're, we're kind of generalizing uh, these um, modular curves. Okay. And then something important to say, um, just to complete this generalization, is that as we have seen, the um, triangle group two, three, infinity is the, um, is the group SL2Z. So we get honest modular curves also by playing this game. So that's why it's fair to call it a generalization. Yeah. I think this is a good place to stop in case uh, anyone has any questions. Yeah, you may go ahead, I think. So uh, that's the story of how you define these curves. And um, sorry if this was just a repeat of how Pete Park's uh, talk went, uh, but I figure it will be important to, to just remind you of the important um, yeah, <laughs> concepts of, of that talk. And now um, what, what we are doing in our work is, uh, okay, we have these new curves and now we want to, uh, have a, an algorithm that runs fast, that we can run and get an answer for, to enumerate uh, all these such curves with low genus. Okay, so um, that's um, the last part of the talk, and then I'll show you a little bit of the magma code um, of this algorithm. Okay, so um, we are going to focus on X naught of ABC, comma p. Um, so these are uh, simplifying to x naught um, is okay because from the genus of x naught, it's really easy to find the genus of x1. Um, so once we enumerate all the x naughts of the genus, we can enumerate all the x ones of the genus basically for free. Um, and then simplifying to a prime just makes our computations be more clear and then you can just use uh, Chinese remainder theorem for most of the cases um, where you don't have a prime, but uh, another idea. Okay. So um, the first thing that we need to do once we, um, yeah, once we move to X naught of A, B, C, comma, P is to compute the genus, right? And uh, what we are going to do is compute the genus, remembering that this is a belly map. Uh, so it's ramified at only three points. Um, maybe we can understand the ramification. And uh, the biggest part of the work is understanding the ramification. And once you under understand the ramification, uh, you can just use riemann hurwitz to compute the genus. So the lemma is that the genus is given by this expression. And I wrote it like this, so 
uh, it will remind you of Riemann Hurwitz. So 2g minus 2 is minus 2 times uh, the degree of the map. It turns out that x naught is a q plus 1 cover of p1. And then the ramification uh, is given by, by this quantity. And uh, what we do is um, we just uh, have a constant k a, a, a k b and k c, and this constant only depends on uh, what s how s divides q minus one g or q q plus one. Um, so maybe I can give you an idea of the proof, uh, and then explain where how why this constant makes sense. So the idea of the proof is that you have um, the triangular modular curves with level structure that we defined before. And then you know that this is a cover of P1 um, of order the size of G. And remember that G is PSL or PGL of a finite field. And then here you have this intermediate curve X of a, X naught of ABC come up here. So it turns out, uh, so and here we, you have uh, the group H naught that we defined before. So it turns out that always uh, the index of G, H naught in G is always Q plus one. So here we have a cover of, um, of, psi Q, of size Q plus one that is ramified at only three points. And then to understand the ramification, um, this cover really wants to be totally ramified. So you want to have cycles of length A or cycles of length B or cycles of length C. So that's why we have A minus one, B minus one and C minus one because we have cycles of length A, B and C. Uh, and how many cycles of those you have just depends on how many, what's the maximum amount of cycles that you can have. So if S divides Q minus one, you have these. Uh, if S divides Q, you have these, and then Q plus one, you have the same. Um, and uh, here, the only subtlety is that uh, when Q is two, um, you uh, sorry when when A when A is two, you can divide Q minus one or Q plus one whenever you take an uh, a node prime. So there is a subtlety at two that needs to be resolved. Uh, but this is the main idea of the lemma. Uh, and we also resolve this subtlety at two uh, for our computations. Okay, so um, once we have this lemma, uh, this allows us also to bound the genus. So um, the genus of X naught is going to be always bigger than this quantity. So uh, once we know what Q is um, and we know what A, B, and C are, we can bound the genus. Okay, and what bounding the genus also gives us is that um, if we rearrange this inequality and then remember that for any hyperbolic triple, this quantity is always bigger than one over 42. Then when we fix a genus that we like, G naught, then we know that Q um, is always smaller than 82 G naught plus one. Okay, so this gives you a bound on Q um, that is just the size of the field where the matrix group is defined. So it's a power of the prime. So this gives you a bound on the prime too. And once you have a bound on the prime, um, and on Q, you can bound A, B, and C. So that's, um, that's just a small justification on why you get uh, finitely many curves of a given genus um, on X naught. Okay? They, the number of curves is, uh, of a given genus is bounded. So uh, there is hope of finding them all because we are always working with these bounds. Okay? And then, um, now it comes our theorem. Now, uh, this is our theorem again, the one that I showed you at the beginning, uh, but now we have defined every, um, every player in, the, in this game, right? So we have our um, curve six naught, and there are exactly 50, 50 cur 
two curves of genus zero, 142 curves of genus one, and then 192 curves of genus two. Um, and this algorithm um, finds them uh, explicitly, and then uh, it, it's also counting them. And so I think I, yeah, I have half an hour left maybe. So I can give you an idea of uh, how this algorithm works, and then we can uh, move to magma um, for a little explanation. But before that, do you have any questions? So uh, what about X, A, B, C, M? Oh, that's a great question. So um, I guess I didn't write it, but um, there it's very rare to have genus zero. I don't think any of them have genus, have genus zero. But yeah, um, sorry, I didn't write it. Yeah, thanks for asking. And the higher genus? Uh... Yeah, so we only have run our algorithm for genus zero, one, and two. Um, sometimes, most of the time, computing the genus is really fast. We have made it really fast in our algorithm, but um, but sometimes it takes a while. Um, so finding genus two took a couple hours, and I guess uh, that's uh, a task that we still have is running the algorithm for higher genus. It can be done, but uh, we haven't done it yet. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so the idea of how the algorithm works is um, you want to you want to find all triples, all hyperbolic triples A, B, C, uh, and primes. We are just doing it for primes uh, first, and then moving from primes to composite ideals is easier. Um, so all uh, hyperbolic triples primes and Galois groups. So we want to find explicitly what the Galois group of X of the cover from X to P1 is. Um, and then we want to find that the genus of X naught is less than G0. Um, and again, we have this assumption that the prime does not divide two ABCs. Two ABC. Um, so what do we do? What we do is uh, we first uh, loop over all possible powers, mm. Q. Remember that Q is just a power of a prime. And then we ask P to be a not prime because P cannot divide, it cannot be two. Um, and then we ask Q to be a smaller than the bound that we, uh, that we saw before. Okay, so this is, uh, our finiteness uh, assumption reminding us that Q uh, can maximum be this number. So we don't have to check um, that many things. For example, uh, when G0 is, is zero, we get our bound of 95. Um, so we have to check all prime powers up to 95, um, which is not a, such a hard, um, thing to check, but then when you increase the genus, for example, when you ask when you ask about genus three, well, that number gets much bigger, right? 84 times four plus one. Uh, so it, it, the computations get uh, much longer uh, because our bound is bigger. Okay, so, um, okay, we look over all these possible powers and then we, for each power we find all the hyperbolic triples um, such that A, B, and C divide one in this group, Q minus one on this set, Q minus one, Q and Q plus one. And that's just remember in our lemma, um, those were the only possibilities for the cycle structure um, of the ramific, yeah, for the ramification of this cover. So uh, that's a, a major, um, um, yeah, a major fact that makes our computations faster is just A, B, and C don't have to be uh, just random numbers. They have to divide at least one of these numbers. So A, B, and yeah, you just look over the divisors of these of these numbers, and that makes and the computations easier. Um, 
And then for each of the triples that you, uh, that you, um, that you pick, you check first that they satisfy this inequality. And this inequality also, also comes from the bound of the genus that I gave you before. Um, but you just, uh, you just know that this quantity has to be smaller than 2g0 G over q minus 1 for the curve to have genus less than or equal to g0. Um, so that's another thing that simplifies our algorithm. And then once you check that, you know that this curve might have genus g0, uh, smaller than g0. So you compute the genus uh, using the lemma that I showed you before. Uh, so you just need to know how you need for computing this lemma, you need to know how uh, A, B, and C divide Q, Q minus one or Q plus one, and that's it. Uh, so this is a very easy computation, unless we are in the set of case that A is two, and that takes a little bit longer sometimes. Okay, and once, uh, once you compute the genus using that lemma, you compare and then you add uh, the list to our low genus list, and that's it. So as you can see, this algorithm is very general. It doesn't have to be genus zero, one, and, or two. Uh, it's just that our computations run faster when we have genus zero, one, and two. And the numbers get pretty big. Uh, the only, uh, yeah, the only list that I was able to fit on the slides nicely is the list for genus zero. So I just wanted to show it to you uh, before we move on to the magma computation. Um, and yeah, here uh, we have all curves, x naught, a, b, c, comma, p. Uh, here we are just choosing p, our rational point uh, below uh, frag p. And that's just, so writing it, it is easier. And um, you can choose any prime of E above the rational prime P and, and the result is the same. So that's why I'm writing the rational P and not the P that lives in, uh, in the intermediate field E. Okay, so we have, um, these are all the ones that have um, an ideal, uh, a prime ideal. Uh, as the level. So uh, we get 47 of those. And yeah, they, uh, they are here. Uh, note that the, the primes don't get very big, but some of them are big enough. I think this one is the, the largest prime that we get. And 41 is a pretty big prime when, because remember that what we are doing is uh, com computing P PGL or PSL, um, of PSL2 of FQ or F, FP in this case, uh, in the case of 41 actually. So this group gets pretty big uh, when the prime is 41, uh, but our computations still work. So that's, uh, that's exciting. Okay. Um, yeah, do you have any questions before we move for 10 minutes to Magma and then uh, call it? I don't want to keep you uh, this light too light. Uh, how would you write uh, algebraic equations for this? Uh, you're writing no, algebraic equations. That's a great question. And um, I mean, this goes back to what Sam, uh, Sam Stock, uh, was it two weeks ago, uh, about computing belly maps. So these are all belly maps. Um, which uh, gives us some hope to find algebraic equations. Uh, but uh, this go goes back also to John's question um, last week of can we for sure, uh, given a belly map, compute the algebraic equations for the curve involved? And the answer is not always, right? Uh, we have some precision problems and um, yeah, um, yeah the precision gets very funky in, in some of these examples. So uh, the answer is you hope that you can do it by just using that these are all belly maps, um, but in practice, it might be harder. Uh, 
Yeah, and as I said, um, this is work in progress. So um, we are working on computing all the algebraic equations for these curves and then finding all the rational points. I mean, uh, finding, I guess, the field of definition in the case of genus zero. Uh, the field of definition might not be the rational numbers, so. So when you consider these as algebraic curves, uh, they will be, in general, they will have singularities, right? Uh, these are all compact Riemann surfaces. Uh, so I don't so know. Are, the, are, are you considering only the function fields up to function fields or up to the actual topological structure? Yeah, that's a good question. I guess I want to say uh, just a function field, um, but I'm not sure. Now, to function fields, you know, there is a non singular model. Yes. But otherwise, yeah. they, they, it will have singularities. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm actually yeah not sure about that. As I said, I mean this is something that we we just started trying, so maybe we can follow up later, and I'll have an answer for you in a month or so. Yeah. So in Sorry. that case, the definition of genus is more tricky. Yeah. For al algebraic curves. Okay. Yeah. Um, are there any more questions before? No, go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my my iPad, and then um, I'm just going to show you a, a quick demo in Magma uh, on how the idea is to convince you of how fast this works. Um, okay, so I I just have a file. To, uh, so this is magma, and then um, I'm just going to so show you. So you are running it on your iPad? Oh, yeah, I was doing my presentation on the iPad, but now okay. you're in my computer. OK, so this magma on your computer. Yeah, magma is in my computer. Yeah. Um, OK, so how this works is, well, we, we can compute the genus of our X naught. And I just want to show, show you how fast it will go um, in general. So for example, we can pick uh, one example of genus zero. Um, let's pick uh, 3819. Um, so that's our, our triple that defines our triangle group. Um, 3819, sorry, yeah, 23819, sorry, 238, and then our prime is 19. Okay, so 238 is our triangle group. Um, 8 or 18. Sorry, what? 8 or 18. 88, thank you. Yeah, uh, that's our triple, it's very small, and then we're choosing the prime 19. Okay, so uh, we run it and um, when, what this code does, we have, we've made it faster uh, since this um, one uh, version of the code, but I just wanted to show you a version that tells you what everything is. So uh, remember that we need to find our level of structure. So that means computing some field extensions of, um, of Q. So the field, um, the first field that we compute is E. So it's a quadratic field over the rational numbers. Um, and then the residue field of 19 has cardinality Q equals 361. So we know that we are working over PGL or PSL of F361. So it's a pretty big field. Um, now we compute our field F that it is the trace field of the embedding, remember? Um, so this has degree four over the rational numbers. And then uh, our prime P does not split completely on this field. So that tells us that our group is PGL um, one instead of P PGL two instead of PSL uh, two. Um, 
And then we use Riemann Hurwitz to compute the genus. But here we have the settlety of two um, that might divide Q plus one and Q minus one. And we need to decide which case we are at. So what the code actually does is uh, it finds a triple in, in this case in PGL F361 uh, that generates our triangle grid. Um, so here are the matrices that generate the triangle group. Uh, and you saw how fast this works, which is um, pretty incredible because uh, this is a, a quite large group, right? Um, so the, the only one that is easy to check is this one. It for sure has um, um, order two, so that makes sense. Um, but then it, it has the three matrices. And once it has the three matrices, it can compute the ramification indices. And then it's telling us that um, the, yeah, the genus is seven. Um, the Q where our uh, PGL or PSL is defined is 361. And then the minus one is telling us it's PGL instead of PSL. It will give us a one if it was PSL. So that's um, that's how one of them works. Maybe we can find one on our list. Um, as I told you, you can play the same game with with some primes dividing two ABC. So this is one of the cases three seven seven seven. So triangle group is three seven seven, and then our prime is also seven, um, and it computes again the um, the fields E and F. Um, and in this case, P is split completely in F7. So that's why we get PSL. So we get PSL uh, of um, F7, and then the genus of our curve is one. Yeah. And um, something else uh, that I wanted to show you is um, how these, uh, works in, in pretty big cases. So for example, if we do two, three, seven, 127, it runs really fast to still, and it finds that the genus is one. Um, so it, it works in most of the cases really fast. And then, I, I don't know, you can pick your favorite triangle um, subgroup and your favorite prime, something like that, and then it, it computes the genus pretty fast. It works really, really fast when you don't have any twos in the triple that you are using to define your triangle group, but it still works fast uh, when, you're, uh, when your element is two and you have to find the generators, um, the triple that generates your triangle group. Um, um, I don't know. Yeah, I think those were, Oh, two, three, seven. Oh, this one is pretty big too. Um, two, three, seven. 127. I think that's the largest prime that is in one of our, our list. That's the largest prime in the list of genus one. Um, and it, yeah, it, it does it pretty quickly. Um, yeah, and I think uh, a note, yeah, in this case, you just get 127. It'd be really unfortunate if you needed a square of 127 or something. Uh, but in this case, it's just that. So it's very convenient. Yeah. And I think that's all I wanted to show you. Um, so thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you for the nice talk and uh, also demonstration using the software. So, yeah, Mirisait has some questions. Uh, yeah. He wants to say something. Yeah, it was very nice. Uh, any questions from anybody or comments? So this magma is freely available to you uh, from Institute or you? Yeah, so yeah, this is what my magma says. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I got it from the Simons Foundation. Um, but you can always, I mean, you can always work in the Magma um, terminal oh. online and it works yeah. pretty fast. Okay, so they're not much different. No, they're not that different. Okay. I mean, 
I guess the only difference is that you can upload files like okay. this, um, but you can always copy paste. And I, I love copy pasting. I just did it loading here so it looked thinner. Um, but yeah, it, it works. It works pretty fast in the terminal. Okay, so your theorems are somewhere not complete, or as you said, your preprint is not yet out. Or you are working sure. something more. Means you said that your preprint is not out yet, right? Yeah, yeah, it's not out yet. Um, it hope it will hopefully be out in the okay. in the next month. I and thought then, maybe some theorem you are still working on. Uh, so yeah, this is part. I guess this is part of my PhD work, okay. and um, yeah, when I think we have some next steps that are coming uh, from this project, but uh, yeah, it's all part of my PhD thesis. Okay. Okay, thanks. Nice talk. Okay, thank See you very much. So we will stop this talk now. With great yeah. thanks, and it was a very nice talk. So yeah. Okay. So we will. I see you sometime other in the maybe year long program or sometime other. <laughs> yes, that's also possible. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.